How you doing? Come on in. You cutting through? No. Are you here, you're here for the interview? Yeah. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, come on in. All right. Fortunately, he can edit. Right. Uh. Are you ready? Ready. Let's do it. You ready? <laughs> yes. You ready? All right. Greetings, everyone. I'm Larry Williams, the director of CARMA, uh, the consortium for the advancement of research methods and analysis, uh, which I'm happy to report is now administratively housed at the University of North Dakota in Grand Forks, North Dakota. And uh, we're coming at you today on uh, Friday, October 31st, Halloween, for another version of our Meet the Methodologist, where I take the opportunity to sit down and chat with uh, our visiting webcast presenter and talk about uh, a variety of uh, work, research, and personal types of issues. So uh, it's a real pleasure to have joining me today uh, Dr. Ron Landis, uh, who's coming uh, from the Illinois Institute of Technology. And uh, this is his second webcast. And uh, Ron, welcome to Grand Forks, North Dakota, and hear. welcome back to Karma. So, uh, Ron, you know, I usually like to find out how people got interested uh, in their careers. People, you, know, you talk to people, they end up in academic positions and they end up in psychology uh, through a lot of uh, different types of routes. What path was yours? Uh, so, that's a really good question. I think I got here by luck, mainly. Um, no, I, when I started as an undergraduate at uh, Penn State, I, I thought I wanted to do something in business. Uh, but never really knew exactly what. Uh, took a class, uh, took some you know, intro classes that first year, and one of the intro classes was an intro to I.O. class that uh, John Matthew taught. And um, there was something about it uh, that just connected. Uh, hearing John talk through the topics and just him personally as well as the material, I thought, that's what I gotta do. And I gotta figure out how to get into that. So. Uh, I was very fortunate to, you know, somehow find the nerve to talk to him, mm -hmm. and uh, he got me working on some projects with some of his grad students, uh, you know, and, and, and sort of things just took off from there. I was fortunate. Jim Farr was my advisor. Frank Landy taught a couple of classes, and, mm -hmm. and I got to know him real well. Rick Jacobs. I, it was just a great place to be for me, and, and I think, in large part, I, I would say that was the point when I thought this is what I want to do. In terms of the academic side of it, I think it was, you know, looking at them as models. But this, is, this looks like a pretty good gig. I wonder how you get into this. Uh, and then, of course, moving on to Michigan State. Yeah, so did you go uh, straight from undergrad into graduate school? I did. Uh -huh. I did, yep. Did Ronald you? got his doctorate in the I.O. program at Michigan State. Yes, yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I remember there were a couple, a couple sort of things that really stick out in my head about grad school. In, uh, so I started grad school the fall of 89. And uh, I'd known some of the, the more senior grad students when I'd visited at different points. But I didn't know who I was entering with, who <laughs> any colleagues would be. And I remember driving out, packed up my stuff, drove to East Lansing, moved in, and uh, Mickey Quinones uh, had me come over and uh, said, yeah, the, one of the guys who's starting with you is staying with us until his place is ready. And I walked in, and there's Jose Cortina. <laughs> And that was sort of the beginning of our uh, collaboration, a long friendship. Time. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and, and um, you know that's a very that was a very clear moment for me when I thought I'm doing the right thing because I'm surrounded by people that I really like and really get along with. Uh, and then the, the other sort of defining thing for me, I think, was you know obviously the program itself. Well, is a well-respected program, and, and and it was a tremendous opportunity. I feel very fortunate to have, but as part of it. We were, we were, you know, given the opportunity to do an applied internship, applied kind of experience. And I did one in, in California, took six months away and did it and thought I really liked it and that was what I was going to do with my life. And I walked back into that building, at, I walked back into the into Baker Hall in Michigan State after that experience and the second I walked in the door I said, nope, this is what I want to do. And that was just a very, it was a moment of, yep, I want to be in academics because it just felt like home. So did you enter into, uh, of course, the reason you're at Karma given a webcast is because you do a lot of methods work. 
what, did you enter into your doctoral program with strong quantitative interest, or was that something that was uh, stimulated by somebody or something that happened there? I think a little of both. I mean, I always like math, stats, kinds of things. Working with John uh, on his projects, you couldn't help but be pulled into that a little bit. Uh, I, I really do go back though and say, and I think it's the training that we got, the exposure we got to the methods and the way it was presented that was really engaging. And you know, it was sort of funny, Jose and I really connected early on, but one of, the, one of our running sort of things that first year was we, were, we would sort of be competing against each other in the stats classes for who could pull the highest grade on the tests. And, ah. You know, a little back and forth, a little friendly competition, but uh, again, I think it was both there was certainly an intrinsic kind of pull, but, but the environment was one that really supported a strong methods emphasis and allowed us to kind of explore that. Mm -hmm. um, and so being surrounded by people that were interested in made it fun too. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, um, uh, this recording will appear on our YouTube channel, and, and uh, part of what we try to accomplish with these Meet the Methodologist sessions is not only learning some about the distinguished people of our field, uh, but also learning from their experiences uh, and so that people may avoid uh, some of the, the wrong turns or the pitfalls that can occur at different stages of their career. So, um, you know, what was, what surprised you about the transition from being a graduate student uh, to being a junior faculty member? What were you unprepared for as part of that process? Um, that's a really good question. I mean, I think a good chunk of it was, so I, I guess I should say when uh, I made that transition, it was just as our first son was born. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I, we, we had our son, in, he was born July 4th. Uh, we moved in August and started a new job right soon thereafter. And that was a lot of life changes and bought a house too. Uh, so I guess I just wasn't prepared uh, for the real world, so to speak. I, I think I was protected as a grad student at the time that I thought, I mean, it felt like I was using all of my time then, but I think in terms of advising students, prepping classes, trying to keep my research going. And then, you know, the thing that always struck me and continues to vex me to this day is the administrative side of things. When you faculty meetings and you have to, you're on this committee or that committee, it feels like your time gets away from you pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think it, part of it for me was just some time management skills, and learning how to deal with keeping a lot of balls in the air at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think in good graduate programs, uh, uh, you don't get exposed to all of those different parts of faculty life. Yeah. So, um, so during those early years then, you know, where you get out of graduate school and you find yourself immersed in scholarship, uh, a lot of times you learn what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so during those early stages of your career, as you look back on it, how did you how did you develop as a scholar or a researcher? When, were there mistakes that you made and things that you learned from that kind of helped enable you to end up having the success that you had? I, I, again, I would go back and say, you know, I, it's easy to, I, I don't want to minimize this. I, I do think there's a certain degree of luck for me. And just mm -hmm. luck may not be the right way of saying it, but uh, so my very first job actually was at George Washington. And I had some good colleagues there, but it was a very different environment for me coming from a big state school to a relatively small private school in an urban setting. And, and again, with a lot of everything going on, it was a very different sort of environment. Um, and, I, and it was challenging those first couple of years. And then I moved to Tulane, and I had great fortune of working with Bill Dunlap mm -hmm. as, as sort of a senior mentor and Mike Burke as a senior mentor within our department kind of I think they really helped me kind of navigate some of those waters, and, and I think there were times that I might have wanted to do one thing where, without being strong about it, I think they were very good about sort of saying, you know, pushing me in the better direction. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think as I look back on it now, I, the one thing I, I, I realized is I did much better when I followed my own instincts in terms of study this. Be, be, you know, it's okay to be interested in this and pursue this as opposed to kind of trying to like, find something that I thought was the fad or the hot topic or something like that. Because mm. uh, I think back to some of the projects that started, kind of died on the vine. Mm. Those were things that I don't know that my heart was ever really in. I thought I should be studying them and I thought I should, this would be a contribution, but they never seemed to pass, pass yeah. muster. 
So what about uh, the teaching side of things? Would you say that your, your interest in teaching was constant during those times? And mm -hmm. how did you balance uh, the demands of the classroom versus uh, the publisher parish kind of uh, rules of the game? So I cheated. Uh, yeah. I combined them. Um, certainly at the graduate level, the undergraduate level less so, but uh, whenever I taught a grad class, whether it was methods, psychometrics, um, SEM, any, any topic that I've ever taught, I've always had projects in lieu of tests uh, for those advanced kinds of courses. And the projects have always been geared around student interests. So you identify a topic, you identify something you want to study, and we'll weave that into the class project. And you know, just off the top of my head, I can think of four papers that are published with mm -hmm. students that have spun out of those classes, and many more that were pretty good in their own right. And so I think I cheated a little bit in that I tried to weave the research interest into the, into the teaching side of, the, side mm -hmm. of things um, and rely on very good students who, who themselves were pursuing things that they were interested in. And um, so what do you teach now? So this, I mean, sort of in my, in my uh, sort of uh, my lineup, my regular lineup is multivariate. I teach an SEM class. Um, this coming semester I'll teach a meta-analysis class. Uh, so, you know, again, more advanced sort of topic. I do teach our, in our stats one and stats two kind of sequence. Those, those are a little less project-based. Those are a little more sort of fundamental. And, um, but certainly on the advanced side of the house, yeah, SEM, meta-analysis, multivariate, those are, those are sort of in the regular rotation. Yeah. As part of my uh, move to the University of North Dakota, I've had uh, been schlepping around plenty of boxes with books, and it's always interesting to open up the boxes and pull the books out and think about the different books that you've <coughs> had, whether it's for a course or for a particular paper. Uh, are there any books that you kind of find comfort mm. in having close by? that you rely on a lot or refer back to a lot, either for your teaching or your research? So, you know, the, uh, what was Cohen and Cohen, and it's yeah. now Cohen, Cohen, West, and Aiken, right? I think that's the, that's the latest incarnation of it. That's one that's dog-eared. It's got sticky notes in it everywhere. It's got notes. Because uh, when I teach the, our, our regression class, I think it's just really well done. It's really yeah. solid. Um, so that would be one that's probably gotten a lot of play over the years. Um, you know, there's actually a number of uh, SEM books. I, I, I one, there's a recent one by Hoyle, it's an edited mm -hmm. book, that I think is actually pretty good, but it hasn't, it hasn't really been out that long, mm -hmm. so it's hard to say that. Uh, you know, certainly on the multivariate side, I think the Tabashnik and Fidel yeah. book is one that I go back to. Yeah. Um, and again, both for readability, uh, thoroughness, uh, you know, I think there's some like that. But yeah, there are, there, are, there are a few that I pull off the shelf, but I, I think of all of them, it's the Cohen. Cohen and Cohen get, yeah. the, get the most play. Yeah. I've kept my 82 version of that as well as mm -hmm. uh, the sub subsequent ones. Well, with all of that teaching at the various levels, uh, what do you think are some of the concepts that students struggle the most with, uh, in spite of your best efforts to approach it this way or that way, whether it's with circles or whether it's with formulas, that they still just don't get it? You know, it's a, I, I don't know if I have one that I would say is consistent across students, but I can say that, for example, when I teach the regression class, you know, we have maybe between 20 and 25 students take that class in any given semester. And, and there, you know, there probably are three or four that moderation just seems to throw them, mm -hmm. you know. And in classes we go through it, they seem to get it. They seem to be able to set up the equations. But where it gets them is when I ask them to plot the graphs. Mm -hmm. Like when I show me the line, show me the lines. Um, I will get two horizontal or two vertical lines on a page. I'll get one line on a page. There's something there that I'm not quite sure, dis despite you know, giving them web resources where all you have to do is plug in the values and mm -hmm. right, you get it. And uh, so, so that's one that, that sort of amazes me, I guess, that sometimes students struggle with that. Uh, you know, in the SEM class, I get the, I, my, my sense is that different students struggle with different parts of that. Um, I don't know if I have one that 
one particular topic that throws students, but I get some students that seem to just get challenged with the, the sort of very basic kinds of concepts, and then some that get through that just fine, and their challenge is more when we get to things like multiple groups, mm -hmm. you know, multi-group CFA or things like, you know, that, but I don't know if I have, have one in particular that, that's ever consistently stuck in my yeah. head. Yeah, for me it's the, uh, at the, at the more introductory level, it's a standard area of the estimate. Oh, yeah? You know, to get students to understand what that means. And then the SEM, with SEM, it's uh, identification. Mm -hmm. You know, so to get them to understand how you can have an infinite set of estimates unless you place some limits in the system that they, uh, it's, it's a real struggle. I, well, so, I, well, I would say I would agree. I, the identification issue is one. And as you say that, yeah, that is something I think students have. The, the SEE one, though, is not one that I man, feel like well, I've had. So maybe, you must just do it a lot better than I, I don't know about that. <laughs> maybe I confuse them so badly that they don't know what question to even ask. <laughs> so, so through your own research, then, and your successes, that led you to uh, getting editorial experience. Mm -hmm. um, uh, at, as associate editor of personnel psychology and associate editor of journal and business and psychology, how has that changed you as a researcher or a scholar? Uh, that experience as an editor. So I hope that it's made me a better writer. I, I certainly feel like when I, if I think about myself, you know, coming out of grad school 20 years ago. Um, and now, to sit down and write a paper, I feel I can be much more efficient, and, 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 so, and I think that's in large part due to reading so much. Um, I, I think part of the transition for me was, as a rev initially as a reviewer, um, it was easy to criticize, and, and it is easy to criticize. It's easy to poke holes in any study and to come up with a, a laundry list of problems. Um, the transition to editor was the one when I realized that but that can't be all, that can't be everything because you have to, part of this is nurturing papers and incubating papers and seeing the solid components. Um, and so from that standpoint, I feel like having been an editor and seeing reviews that are somewhat, sometimes very constructive, sometimes not so constructive, now when I go back and act as a reviewer, I hope that, that I hope I'm a better reviewer now having mm -hmm. served as an editor. Uh, and, and I think too, just going through that process and, and putting yourself in those shoes. So when you were the author, what did it feel like getting these comments? And um, you know, I think I hope that it's made me more uh, helpful in that regard. That I'm not just finding problems; that I'm actually trying to find solutions. Mm -hmm. Well, I know that you've got uh, some interesting stuff you're doing at the Journal of Business and Psychology. Uh, but before I ask you about that, I just wondered, you know, I hang, a lot of the people that we hang out with, there's kind of like a lot of uh, disenchantment uh, with the state of our science and uh, uh, the way the publishing system seems to be working or not working. And well, what kind of views do you have about those types of issues? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think we, we could be doing things better. And I, and I do think that... You know, if you really push me on, in, you know, my sort of most cynical day, uh, I, I feel like we now have a literature that really is just about us talking to each other and not really thinking about a wider world consuming what we're doing. And and what I think that means is uh, we use jargon, we use uh, language that doesn't necessarily easily translate to to the quote unquote real world. We engage in practices that allow us to continue to publish. But don't, I don't think we really think as a field uh, about that body of research that we're publishing. Mm -hmm. um, and I get it. I mean, there's certainly there's incentives, particularly for those of us in academics, to publish, and not just to publish, but to publish in certain outlets. That really determines things like job security through tenure. It, it determines promotions. It determines other incentives that one might get. I, so I think there are lots of pressures in the system there. Um, but, but I always think there's room to get better. And, and I feel like there are a number of people, I agree with you, when I talk to people, there's disenchantment. But I also think there's some ideas of, well, we, we can make this better. It's within yeah. our power to make this better. So and I so that's that is optimistic. A, well, and that's a good segue, because I think you're trying to make it better with what you're doing at Journal of Business and Psychology. So can you tell sure. uh, our viewers about that? Sure. I mean, I, that's one of the things that I'm most excited about. Uh, so uh, Stephen Rogelberg and I, and, and Jose is also helping with this, uh, 
have sort of thought about a different publishing model. And we don't claim that this is brand new. We didn't invent this. In fact, there's a number of journals already doing it. Uh, but the concept is, is broadly conceived under this idea of registered reports. So the notion is that uh, rather than the traditional model where a researcher does, or author does a study, submits the study for publication, the paper gets reviewed and edited, and subsequently an up or down decision, ours is a two-step process. We're proposing a two-step process or allowing a two-step process whereby uh, prospective authors submit proposals to us. Just like a master's thesis, just like a doctoral dissertation, you, you would submit to a committee. Uh, the authors submit to the journal an intro, hypotheses, methodology, proposed analysis, that, that document, that submission is vetted just like we would vet, just like we would review any other article. Um, be sent to reviewers, the reviewers would evaluate it, would comment positives, negatives, uh, and what that could lead to in a successful case would be what we call an in principle acceptance of the paper. Mm -hmm. So we are agreeing to publish the work once the data are collected, the analyses run, and the paper finally written, regardless of the outcome. Assuming, pending, that the authors have appropriately followed what they said mm -hmm. they would do. And our hope there is that we kind of pull away this idea that you have to have significant results, mm -hmm. that the paper is getting sort of m massaged as it mm -hmm. goes through the review mm -hmm. process to be something different than it started. And, and we hope that that introduces a bit of transparency, honesty to the process. Um, and, you know, I, we're excited about that. I think, I don't know that that's the solution. I hope it's part of, a, 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 you know, a step in the right direction. Um, but, yeah, it's something we're really excited about. Yeah. So, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, what brings you to Grand Forks, North Dakota, and Karma is given a webcast, uh, which this is kind of our reversal of how we usually do it. Usually we do the interviews before the webcast, and I ask people, what are you going to be talking about? Can you give a summary of uh, what you talked about about an hour ago when you gave your webcast lecture? I think I blanked it all out of my <laughs> <laughs> uh, Some about hard and soft hard science. Hard science, yeah, I remember something. Uh, no, I, I think, you know, it's around, and it's tied to this issue of, of, of our publication process and sort of how we're perceived at large, to the public at large. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think I grew up and, uh, you know, learning our field, understanding our field, to thinking we're a soft science, to being told we're a soft science. Um, and I was one of the people who always kind of rejected that and thought, I don't want to be a soft science. That, that's not good. I don't like that label. And so in recent years, I've tried to get into this uh, a little bit more to try to understand, is it important? Why is it important? How is it important? So, you know, the bulk of the talk today, I think, try to develop that a little bit to, to identify, well, what is this distinction? What is at the core of this distinction? Uh, and in my view, fundamentally, it should be about rigor of science. Um, and then, you know, taking a look at what we do. And I think to be objective, to try to be objective, there are some things we do that clearly make us a soft science. The way we bring theory into our papers or don't. Uh, the degree to which we actually test the models that we say we're testing and report those results in a way that's transparent and, and ac accurate. Um, but then there are other things that we do that I think we should be proud of. I think things like karma are, are, are things to me that suggest we do have a desire to be strong, to be rigorous, uh, to, to, to actually do good work. Um, and so, I, I, again, I think that I hope what came out during the talk today was this idea that, yeah, we're soft. People think we're soft. And in many ways, we bring that on ourselves. But there are some things that we do well, and we shouldn't lose sight of that. And in fact, we should be building on those things. Yep, yep. Um, OK, so uh, last question. You've been able to uh, sustain uh, a level of engagement and a level of uh, a commitment and a level of success at your performance uh, over, uh, uh, don't mean to make you feel old, but over a pretty long career. Yeah. So what, what, is, what, what is the key to that? What drives you? How do you self-regulate or put your workspace together that gives you the vibe that enables you to do what you do? Um. That's a really good question. I mean, I, it, part of it is I, I've always, like, I think as I mentioned to you, from the, from the moment that I sat in John's class as an undergraduate, I was excited by the topic. So that's never left. I really think that what we do is interesting um, and important. But really, I think what drives me is I love working with students. And I love the idea of seeing students generate ideas, take those ideas through the proposal development process, collecting data 
that's really what jazzes me is seeing new people come into the field and I feed off that excitement. I mean, it's their energy. And, mm -hmm. and I would extend that to the people that I collaborate with. You know, when I get to hang out with people like you, when I'm working with Jose over the years, their energy, I mm -hmm. feed on that energy too. I mean, I use that to, you know, if there's ever a dark day when I think I'm trash it all, I'll do something else, you know, then you can't. There's just too many good people doing too much cool stuff, and you know, I don't want to be left behind. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I don't think you're at much risk of being left behind. <laughs> Uh, but we are very appreciative of uh, you making yet another contribution to Karma, and we appreciate you uh, making the trip up uh, to Grand Forks, North Dakota. And it's been a pleasure hosting you here. It's a great webcast, and um, thanks again. Oh, it was awesome. Yep. Appreciate being invited. Thank you. It's cookie time. <laughs> You know, I was thinking, man, the, uh, 